Welcome guys. Uh, so today we're going to talk about gear or investing wisely in your gear. And uh, as always, I got my brother here. Uh, Hello everyone. Hi guys. All right. And uh, if, what's it called? Um, so yeah, so let's just, let's start the show, I guess. So uh, here. First thing I guess I'll tell you guys to do uh, is, uh, and I provided the link for that, or you can just go to my website, uh, is so you so it's sort of you can kind of follow along. And the reason why I'm doing also today this show about, about this topic is because um, uh, I get a lot of questions. Like probably the number one question is, what camera should I buy? And like sometimes people send me different options, which camera I think is better, or what lenses I should buy, things like that, right? Uh, so I thought I would just kind of get get into it. Actually, another one probably my, very popular is which uh, camera stabilizer, right, Lucas? <laughs> or gimbal? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's gimbals. That's one piece of gear that people get really excited about. I guess cameras and and the gimbals, right? And drones. Yeah. Those three. Those are the three top categories. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, uh, f first page I'll tell you guys here to go to is uh, it's basically Tom Antus. Films. Maybe I'll actually bring it up on screen so you guys can. Uh, there, you guys can see it. I mean, you should know the website, but all right. Uh, where do I go here? Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I I know where to go on my website. I'm just like doing everything at once here, streaming, adjusting the audio, all those things. Uh, so it gets a little crazy sometimes. But anyways, um. Uh, let me switch here to uh, no. All right, there we are. Oh no, wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right, there I have it. Okay, there's the website. <laughs> All right, you guys should see this. So just go to tomantosfilms.com. Um, and uh, yeah, once you're here, you know, you see all the articles and everything we put up, like all the posts. But here, I've, we set up a page. We've had this page actually uh, on for uh, for for a while, I think, right, Lucas? When, when do we? Uh, early on, since, you know, it's, we get so many questions. Yeah. Uh, apologies if my, apparently my voice is delayed, so. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so right from early on, because it's, it's something that we can, uh, you know, we get get asked a lot, and uh, it's kind of difficult to answer the same questions. So we, so we try to, we, I try to organize it now. Yeah, and, so and, w and we're updating it, right? And actually, that's another thing is like we've made major updates now in kind of the, these subcategories. So if you go into gear, yeah, the gear basics, and we have all these categories. Uh, it's still, I, mean, I guess, it's always going to be a work in progress, right? Right? Lucas? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. that's the thing I wanted to change because. You know, we created our accommodations like two years ago or something, and we didn't really update. So now I want to make sure, rather than doing like another big job, I just want to continually update it. You know, as we as we find if we find gear that we kind of like more than the one we are recommending, then we'll do yeah, that, right? Yeah, exactly. So like, if you go here, you know, gear and then gear basics, you'll see here it's divided into categories like cameras, lenses, lights, uh, audio gear, drones, shoulder rigs and tripods, stabilizers, camera sliders. Camera dolly, uh, cam you know, camera accessories. Some of these categories might change from time to time, but you can always just basically click here on the gear page, and it will take you here. So let's see, investing wisely in film gear, <laughs> hence the the name of the show. Uh, so this is like a little intro here, and then here you also can jump to all the different categories. Um, and I will probably like if you have a question, like pretty much if you have a question for me with regards to what camera I should buy, you know, uh, what's whatever you know what what drawn or things like that um, go check out over there that page because that's the page that uh, uh, most likely you're gonna find the, the, the you know answer to your questions it is you know there's a lot of stuff to cover so hopefully like you know the, the fact that it's divided into different subcategories and kind of help you better but I'm gonna go over it right now and kind of talk about why I think you know this is better or that is that is better and then you guys can also jump in and just let us know in the comments, like, what do you think? Maybe you disagree with some things or, you know, or let, let basically people, because at the end of the day, this is just my opinion, right? Uh, this is my opinion, my advice. Uh, I also have here, uh, you know, so one, one time somebody was on Facebook asking me what's the favorite gear in a B and H, whatever, gear. Uh, it's kind of similar thing. I'm trying to update it. It's not as fast updating this thing as, uh, as basically when I'm updating, um, uh, you know, on our, on, website. On our website. But 
here's kind of like I just you know and also it doesn't really explain it just shows you a whole bunch of gear and this is basically just gear that I own and I use uh, and then again you have different categories here you can change to but uh, but I, again if you want more in-depth you probably want to go here just to the main gear page advice uh, and then just scroll to whatever category you're interested in so let's say if we go into uh, cameras so cameras let's see here what we've put in here so this is uh, this this has been updated I know some of the pages I think still haven't been like no no it's been all updated everything's all, all updated the, okay, I still want to add a few more things but all the all the information there is updated you know as of today yeah everything is current oh yeah okay so the view, I know you were on it Lucas because I was <laughs> yeah so yeah so and, and you guys can thank Lucas for keeping us keeping us up to date here uh, and if here's like you'll notice here I have just like a few general points about cameras perspective and and kind of I guess almost to uh, I'm hoping that when you guys read this stuff here uh, before we get into extra specific camera models that this will kind of help you ask yourself the right questions because you know like I always say at the end of the day uh, there is no perfect right camera and the reason is because there's different people on that, that have different needs and different shooting styles, different jobs that we're doing. And so because of that, you kind of you kind of have to ask yourself exactly what it is that you need, what kind of a tool you're looking for. So especially when it comes to cameras. Uh, and there's a lot of things to, like I said, to, to kind of go through. Um, and that's the reason why I think it's best when it's in this kind of a written form. Because this is not something that I can, you know, like when people ask me in a comment on, on YouTube and stuff, when I can, I answer it, but a lot of times it's just it's a very long answer. Like you can see here, there's a lot of information. Um, so you you can kind of, like I said, go through it and and kind of see the first here. I guess point to sort of a full frame sensor, uh, whether you need that, right? Uh, and there's also you know there's advantages, but there's also actually disadvantages to having full frame. So you really kind of I would say you know you want to go through it. Uh, you want to make sure that it, uh, that that you're again ask yourself the questions. Do you really need a full frame camera? Uh, and then kind of gives you kind of you know the micro four third sensor right like again there's advantages to that and disadvantages right um, so yeah I would just say kind of you guys read this but uh, I guess what's the uh, do we have any questions right now Lucas then well I see one interesting comment from Derek he says that uh, basically I guess he made a big uh, years ago made a big investment into his gear but he put it all on credit cards and he's racked up like eighty thousand dollars worth of holy shit Head, so it took him years to pay off. So I guess that's why we say you know invest wisely because we are you know we talk a lot about gear because it's, it's interesting. I mean even if you're not going to buy it, yeah, it's, it's a lot of stuff that's interesting to try out. I mean if you're about, into right? it, yeah, if you're into yeah, it, it's sort of like it's, cars or exactly. you know, it's fun geeking like out over, but it doesn't right. mean you have to buy it. But we're not like we don't want to really push people to buying stuff and you know the latest cameras necessarily. If you know especially depending on your situation, right? So. So and especially when it comes to like beginners, I think it's just good to have it's good to have your own camera for sure, but something that you can easily afford and then just like, you know, you can learn all the mistakes on it and then and then and then you progress, right? But uh, you know, I always want to like under, you know, uh, uh, emphasize that we are not like really trying to push all these products. We we don't want people to just jump on the latest thing, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, talk think about it, read about it, find out and some makes sense for you to get it, get it, right? Sometimes it just makes sense maybe to you know to rent stuff, right? That's especially if you become, you know, you have you get hired a lot. And it oftentimes makes more sense to to rent than just buy. It's a kind of a side side topic, but I was. Uh, what do you think, Tom? I don't know. Do you want to no, yeah, get yeah. into it? I I think so too. I I think like especially when 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 we were starting out. I mean, there was a lot of jobs that we were doing that. Like I said, we had our own. I would say those ultra low budget or no budget jobs that we were doing where it it made sense to own like a little camera right so we owned whatever we could afford at the time and like i said oh, what oh sorry well what client can afford in a way i was thinking exactly. like that like yeah. what's the best thing what's the best camera for the client right yeah exactly uh and so that's what i'm saying is like we we would kind of like I said for those really low low budget and no budget jobs yeah you, you want to have something right so you can execute a job but it could be you know a simple three hundred four hundred dollar you know camera like i'm going to show you guys in a second there's some great options out there and that's what we were using but then that doesn't mean that we weren't ready to do bigger jobs because yes when a bigger job came came along and a client was able to afford and and i'll tell you sometimes we literally had a client that came and said to us like 
okay i want to do this video i love what you guys are doing but i want it to be shot on the you know the red epic and then we're like okay we can do it this is how much it's going to cost right you just charge the client for it and you let them know and and when a client is really like you know obviously sometimes you might get you know really unreasonable clients i'm sure you guys probably have stories like that where uh, a client comes in and just i don't know you know it's like i have 500 dollars and i want to shoot in the red epic and you know i want to have aerial shot and all that stuff and you kind of just say, well, then, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't do that job, right? Or you try to convince them and say, well, maybe you don't need to, you know, with that budget, it's better to spend it on something else. But when we did have the budget, yeah, we would just go and rent it. So you can rent cameras and you really do shouldn't try to, like, especially, like, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the comment that we just had left where, you know, somebody racked up $80,000 on their credit cards. You really do not want to do that. I would say you should be kind of building up your, your, your gear, uh, and, and the number one thing I would actually like, like I said, first, obviously have a camera. That's something that you can afford, but something that like, it doesn't matter whether you have a paying job or not, you can pay it off right now. And it's not sitting on your credit cards because that's the worst thing you can do. Credit card debt or just like student loan debt, all that stuff. It's just, it's going to kill you. So that's number one thing It's just whatever you know, you're going to buy it. Even if you use a credit card, make sure at the end of the month, you, you have the money there to pay for it. But the first, I would say, things you kind of want to invest in is actually a nice set of lenses, maybe, you know, some st stabilizer or like a tripod, because those are things that you're going to reuse. You can use it for years, if, especially if you take care of the, the lenses and the tripod and all that stuff. I mean, I had my first tripod. It was a Manfrotto. I forget now what it was. It was this tiny little thing, and I shot uh, so many projects on it. Like, I've had it basically for over 10 years before I actually upgraded for my, you know, to my next tripod. But in the meantime, I was going from camera to camera, whether I was renting different cameras or I upgraded my cameras and things like that. So cameras, I would almost say those are the things that you're going to change the most. And so that's why don't buy a camera that you can't afford to pay for right now. Now, if you, for example, have, I don't know, a lot of jobs lined up, um, and, and you know, you're kind of like guaranteeing yourself that for the next two, three months, you can make, let's say, $20,000 and, and you're OK, you know, then putting all of that earnings that you have towards, you know, paying off your camera. Well, then, yeah, then you can go on and, and buy a camera for $20,000. But otherwise, do not do it. Like the people ask me, like, what's the most expensive camera I've bought? And I think to date, the most expensive is, it was $11,000. I've never and that's like a whole kit and everything that I got. I've never actually, like those really expensive cameras, I would either borrow them, rent them, whatever I could do, uh, you know, charge them. To, to but for years, for, for years, the ex most expensive camera that we had was the Canon 7D, right? Well, I mean, well, no, no, because I mean, if Canon 7D was the most expensive, I would say, when, oh. when it came to the DSLR revolution. But right, we had, right, right. We had, a Portal, yeah. we had a film camera, you know, that we owned for a while. We shot a bunch of projects. We, oh, if I bought this, you know, the, you guys, some of you guys might remember the Canon XL1, you know, the right. big, nice, it looked really cool. And now when I think about it, I mean, I guess for the times it was good quality, but yeah, it was a lot of money. It was, that was seven and a half thousand dollars, I believe, when I bought it. So, uh, it was, you know, like I said, it's it was a big expenditure. Now, again, I at that time, I bought it because I was working full-time doing visual effects. I had a really nice, paying, cushiony kind of job. And my directing kind of jobs that I was doing was all, you know, afterwards, on the weekends, kind of on the sides. So I, but I could pay off basically for that camera, you know, it took me like, what, one or two months I was, the camera was paid for. So I didn't, I never bought things and I just left it all on the credit cards. Like that's just, I think horrible, horrible. And that's not wisely investing in your thing. So like I said, invest as you're growing. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't do bigger jobs. If you do, just charge the client for it and rent the gear for that one or two days. Uh, but otherwise, just slowly build up your gear list. And I would say, like I said, cameras especially are very risky because the technology changes. People want the newest, latest, like image sensor and whatever it can deliver. Whereas lenses, once you have a good set of lenses, just you'll stick with them. You'll sw swap them out and use them in different cameras using adapters and things like that. So oh, I think I think the Canon, the not Canon, but the uh, Panasonic GH5 is such a nice camera because it's still not so expensive. Where you know, like many people can buy it without going to you know big debt. Yeah, you know, and but still, it's a camera that for learning and like actually has a lot of you know pro features. So you can you can do a lot with it, learn a lot on it, right? And then and then for many clients, you're not going to price yourself out because you have a too expensive a camera, right? So you can still take on a lot of jobs where the budgets are not huge, not big. Yeah. So GH5 is a, is a nice nice camera, right? Because again, yeah, you can buy a camera. Yeah, I think right now especially like it gives you you know. Gives you some really pro tools, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. So, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, um, there's a question here I see from uh, Reginald Esk. Uh, that's a username. Anyways, uh, how do we insure our shiny new cameras and gear insurance? Uh, that's actually one. There's different ways you can approach it. There are some companies that are just just going to be specialized in uh, in gear thing, but uh, in, like insuring just specifically the gear. But you know what? Literally, if you're living like doesn't matter whether you're living with your parents still, and you're a young filmmaker starting out, or you're living on your own. You most likely you're living somewhere. Um, you know, I mean, I guess unless you you don't own a place, but if you own a place. Uh, and you have basically home insurance or condo insurance, whatever, you can actually put your things under your home insurance. So go to your insurance company and they'll basically, you know, f uh, ask you to, you know, put a, so basically create a whole list of, of your gear, the serial numbers, all that stuff. And different insurance companies will treat it differently. But the good thing is by going with your home insurance is it's really going to, cost you like almost nothing like you will see almost no difference and they will that will basically ensure your gear like while it's in the house so it doesn't get stolen while you're using it let's see in your house all that stuff but even if you're like the vicinity of your house now if you want to go traveling a lot of insurance companies will actually still you know your home insurance will then give you a deal for that so they'll kind of insure it while it's in the house let's say your house burns down all of that gear is covered and that's kind of what I'm doing with my gear. And and at the same time, you can say, well, sometimes I travel with my gear. I need to be able to take it on road. And whatever gets stolen while, you know, I don't know, I'm in South America or something, uh, you know, is it going to be covered? Then they'll basically, they'll charge you a little extra. But because you already have, you know, home or whatever insurance with them, or let's say car, you know, they'll give you a bundle and you can you can save a lot. Because I, I, from my experience when I was shopping around for insurance for my gear, it's, it costs a lot more when you just went with just a company that just does, the, you know, insures just the, the camera gear. So that's that's what I can see. I don't know, Lucas, if you have something. Uh, no, no, that that that's I believe that's the case. And uh, you know, I mean, uh, in general, of, of general, uh, the, like the you know insurance for equipment, it's not so it's not so expensive, especially when you compare it to general liability insurance, right? Like if you want to get filming permits and so on, usually you need, you need that kind of you know. Uh, general liability insurance and that is actually m m much more expensive than getting the, the equipment insurance so if you you know if you have a production company and you're getting filming permits and so on then it's not going to be a major issue for you, you know, it's not going to be much more expensive to get that kind of insurance but you yeah. probably know that already but um, but yeah like what Tom said it's a simple way to get insurance but I mean the other type of insurance is Sort of what you do with it, <laughs> what you do with your gear, like you know, take some precautions. Exactly. Right? There's some simple things. That's a, that's a big thing where you're going to just reduce your risk a lot, right? Just by being careful, smart where you store your equipment and how you handle it. Yeah, definitely. Always keep an eye out on on your camera gear. Like I remember, I was shooting in in South America and Ecuador once, and uh, uh, and it, I mean, it happened so quickly too. It was just it's funny, but it was uh, funny now. But I was so pissed off at the time. Uh, basically, I had an underwater camera, you know, Sony. I forget now the model. But really cool little camera, and uh, and yeah, and and I, if I was, we were shooting with it for for a few weeks, no problems, and then I went literally in this little town that we were filming. I went to grab a, like a little, little corner store to to buy a drink, and and what was that? I was holding the camera here. I had to take out the wallet, and then I was like, oh, I had the drink, and I was I'm like, okay, let me. And I literally put the camera down on the counter, like the the clerk, the store clerk was right there. So I'm, uh, you know, to this day I'm kind of saying that either it was the store clerk that literally robbed me or somebody like he was working with, because he claimed he didn't see anything. But I put this thing down, and then my friend like called me over. I looked over my shoulder, said, "Okay, yeah, just a second. I turn and it's gone. Like I'm not not joking. It was like a, a second. It felt like a second, and it was gone. And I'm like, "What? The, where's the camera?" And then the guy, you know, he's like, "Oh no, what camera? There is no." I'm like, yeah, I put it right here. So the store owner was claiming he didn't see anything, and then I looked, and the, whoever was on my right side, I didn't even see, was kind of like waiting behind me, was gone. I mean, it was just, yeah. So I lost, uh, you know, I lost a lot of money. So a lot of times, from that point on, what I always do is, especially when I'm traveling in places where, you know, I I know there's bigger chance of somebody just, you know, stealing stuff like, you know, right in front of your eyes, you could say. Uh, I, I'll have a, a strap always kind of wrapped around my hand for the camera or if it's a, it's a camera backpack that has all the gear and everything, I'll put it, but I won't just put it on the ground, like you know, sometimes you need to rest it while you're operating the camera, but I'll put it and I'll put like my leg through the hoop or something like that, like just do whatever you can so that people, it's not so easy for somebody to just grab it and thing. but yeah, that's the best insurance. Okay, Mike, here I've got a good question about the gear. Um, yeah. uh, 
can you uh, from Ionis uh, Sputnik and he's uh, asking um, like what's the basic differences between or difference between handheld gimbal uh, and something like a Ronin 2 I guess uh, beside the cost so what's like I guess, I guess it will, the way I'm seeing the question is is there a big difference between these you know average gimbal and those top of the line gimbals like the Ronin 2 um it's what, what do you mean like handheld doesn't like the traditional state like like a steadicam stabilizer or maybe that's what he means i'm yeah, i'm kind of reading into the question i'm not 100 percent sure so because i mean uh, the, yeah the, th that's how i understand the question and i would okay. say and yeah the difference is uh and that's again if you go to a stabilizer page on, on on the on our website on the gear you know advice you'll see me talking about it where steadicams are have a bigger learning curve so to learn to use a steadicam like a traditional stabilizer whether it's like a little glide cam steadicam uh you know basically one that uses gravity right uh those things they take learn longer to learn and and you really have to practice to kind of get good at it but i think it's almost like riding a bicycle once you do get good at it you're not going to forget it but you you want to i would say the first few weeks literally every day as much time as you have practice and i'm actually because some people are asking me I'm, I'm thinking of doing a video kind of showing you guys how you practice to get better you operating a steady cam but you you practice because it's kind of muscle memory and once you learn it so that, that's i would say the bad thing is you takes a while to learn but once you learn to use those things doesn't matter whether it's a big full-size steady cam or like a little you know stabilizer for a gopro camera once you learn to use it you're going to be able to get smooth shots with those things all the time because i mean unless they like break in half or something those things don't stop working um and that's the good thing about those you know like i said those traditional stabilizers the digital three-axis stabilizers they're great because you can just jump in there and you know pretty much any idiot can grab it and start operating it and using it and right away and, and get like get smooth shots um, and sometimes I see people just getting smooth shots, but getting like moving the camera all over the place too much. So that's that's another thing to consider. Uh, but but the problem with those is uh, it's an electro electrical device. So you gotta you know with all the electronics you gotta protect it from the weather. Um, you know like when it starts raining and stuff, a lot of these gimbals you cannot use them. Uh, uh, whereas the traditional you know kind of like the gravity you know uh, stabilizers, the handheld ones. Uh, they they will work. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's raining or not. If your camera is weatherproof, you can keep on shooting. So that's the problem with the digital stabilizers. Also, uh, a lot of things can throw the balance off of it. Like if there's a lot of electromagnetic interference, or like especially if you're traveling from one place to another, and let's say you had it in the back of your car next to your big powerful speakers, which again generate electromagnetic magnetic field, or if it's in the cargo hold of the airplane while you're traveling then once you get it out there a lot of times those gimbals the horizon's going to be crooked or things like that and you got to recalibrate it and trust me it's a hustle sometimes like especially when you like just get out there and you just get a shot quickly and then you turn it on and the gimbal's like mm, or it starts freaking out or something and that happens with all of them the, the ronins them the movi all, all of them have these problems uh, and then also just the last thing is just batteries i mean you run out of batteries that's it that thing doesn't work so that's the disadvantage of that advantages i guess of the digital ones is that they're just easier to get smooth shots like to operate because it kind of does the work for you but i always still tell people if you're gonna especially if you do like a big job yeah you can take a digital you know stabilizer but always have a like a traditional steady cam glide cam kind of device as a backup because it's going to save your ass many times um there was one job I did in particular. I remember a music video I shot where I wish I had it and I and I didn't. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm kind of like I said, just ruined a lot of the shots that I I had. You know, kind of had to cross them off my list. Um, so yeah, so that's something to co to consider. Um, and and like I said, and also on top of that, usually the traditional like glide cams and all those things they're just cheaper too. So that's that's another thing. So yeah, let me kind of jump into also before I take more questions. Um, I want to show you guys. When it comes to this gear, like let's say you're just starting out, you literally just starting out. You know, you have nothing. You know, not you. You don't own any gear, but you want to be, you know, videographer, man, do wedding videos, corporate videos, or filmmaker. What should you invest in? Well, like I said, first you should have some kind of a basic camera. Now, if you don't have, I mean, you know, you can try to always meet people in your area, or whatever, borrow it. But it's, like I said, it's best to have something, something's affordable that you can buy. For the longest time, the camera I was recommending was a Sony NEX5R. Those are really hard to come by now. If you can find it, you can you know still use it. And I did a review of it, which is a link for all of this stuff here. So again, if you read my guide here on my website, you will you will see all this information. Um, 
but anyways so in here i say kind of because the camera is discontinued the next camera is kind of its successor is the sony a6000 amazing camera it's hd but it will allow you to do slow motion 60 frames per second and, and like has a lot of cool functions it's really beautiful hd food footage that you can record with it um so i would say that's like the, the camera that like, you know one of the cameras i would say that's like a good starter camera especially if you want to go with the whole mirrorless uh, you know side of things with smaller cameras um you know uh yeah it, it just I, I think they're more better suited for videos um so so that's the camera and and again you can check like here the what is it like let's say let's, I don't know, let's check on bnh you'll all the links are provided for you so you guys can see it you can see right now what is it 648 dollars just the camera with uh, with the kit lens and i would recommend you guys go always get the kit lens that's something i talk about again in the in the lens uh, page of this uh, you know uh, category here of this gear advice uh but you can also buy it like on ebay a lot of times you can buy these cameras used like you can even you can see already a uh, hundred bucks cheaper um uh, so or here somebody's selling it for 490 i mean you can really find deals sometimes i found this camera the sony a60 a6000 for 300 dollars. so you know that's again that's a great starter camera and if you you know if you're i don't know young guy girl in school still maybe you can get a part-time job and you can definitely put away that kind of money um, you know, save up your money, whatever it is, and and that's a good starter camera, and with just a kit lens, and it's gonna serve you well. Uh, if you want to go, you know, the Canon route, and again, Canon EOS 80D, that's another great option. It's just a great all-around, you know, DSLR camera, but uh, it's one thing that we uh, kind of say in here is has the amazing uh, autofocus. It has the Canon's dual pixel AF, which if it's something that you really want, and you, again, you you don't have money to buy like the more expensive cameras, then this is an amazing camera. Uh, I doesn't have great slow motion options and all that stuff, but you know it's. I, I, other than that, I think, uh, like I said, it's it's uh, it's, a, it's a great camera. And again, look around for different prices and don't be afraid to just buy used stuff. Look it up on eBay. Let's see if they have any here on eBay that are for sale. Uh, these are all new. Uh, you can see this one's used. It's like a hundred bucks cheaper than the other ones. Uh, so yeah, you can definitely find uh, these deals. Um, and especially when it comes to lenses, lenses to make sense to buy. Yeah, especially uh, yeah. used, right? Because lenses, I mean, stay good, you know, as long, you know, most people are careful with lenses. So, and you can see right away when you get the one, whether, you know, it's been damaged or not. If you don't, if yeah. it's clear, if there's no scratches, then you're good with the lens, right? Yeah. It's going to serve you. So now, it's a little risk. Another camera I would say is if you kind of entry level camera, but let's say you want to shoot 4K, whatever, maybe you're getting jobs that the client requires 4K or for yourself, right, you want it, then there's a bunch of these cameras, one the, that, that I, we were kind of recommending with Lucas, that's his go-to camera, what he uses always, is the Panasonic Lumix G85, and it's it's a great 4K, it's beautiful 4K camera with in-body, you know, image stabilization, all that stuff, that's still affordable, and again, uh, let's look. And, let's and actually, I wanted to add it, add it, like I heard some gossip, supposedly some some executives for Panasonic who are, are thinking that they underpriced this camera, they should have actually, you know, charged more for it. Oh. <laughs> that, uh, and it's selling very well, this camera, right? It's selling very, very well because yeah. for what it gives you, it's really, you know, a good price. Yeah. So, so that's definitely one. And like I said, this is all gear that we own and we use on a regular basis. And that's the reason why we can give you this. And so there might be sometimes... Like I said, you guys heard some advice from somebody else, and or you disagree with our advice here. Let us know. Let us know, especially in the comments. I think, but I'll just tell you, I cannot talk about things. Me and Lucas, we cannot talk about things that we don't have personal experience with, and that's the reason why we talk about these specific cameras. So, and, and that's why we always kind of back it up, where we again provide here, see full review of this camera that we did here, because we're letting you know we used it. This is the kind of shots we got, and then you can watch the full review and you can kind of get a better idea of this. So each in these categories, you'll see this kind of again. We link to whenever we can to our articles or our posts and stuff. So you can kind of really see a, a more elaborate, basically, option, like, basically, our opinion on, on, on these products. Um, another camera that this is, a, like, a favorite of mine now, I'm, I've been using it so much for the last, basically, like, month and a half, uh, is the Sony Alpha A6500. It's a bit more expensive, but it's, like, an amazing 4K camera, amazing out-of-focus, tiny little camera. Uh, I actually just recently uh, got a... Um, uh, what do you call it? Like a, a whole underwater kind of uh, housing for it, and you can. That, that's the beautiful thing is you can shoot 4K with good out of focus and all that stuff, which is kind of crucial when you're shooting underwater because it's very difficult to focus underwater. 
uh, but you can do all those things uh, and with this camera like to get like a and, and you can get really professional 4k footage underwater for example uh, because the the because this camera has affordable underwater housings whereas if you buy like the you know let's say you buy the ursa and you're like okay you know i spent all of my money on that camera but i have it it's a great camera but now let's say you can't afford to buy a tripod or good lenses or let's say you want to shoot underwater well all those things for usually for the for like a more expensive camera the accessories are going to be a lot more expensive so again that's something to consider and so like i say if you have a little bit more money uh you want to kind of go for these i would say mediums range kind of budget cameras then a6500 is, is one of the cameras i can highly recommend and, and i love using it myself for whether it's doing these youtube videos or just even like some filmmaking projects here uh, that I'm, i have lined up in the future another great 4k camera that's again you know uh, it's a little bit more expensive than the a6500 is the uh, panasonic lumix gh5 doesn't mean that you can't like i got a question two days ago somebody asked me on facebook about the uh, they're looking about the gh5 or the gh4 and it was uh, from india a question and they said that as again in, in india the gh5 costs like three times as much as the gh4 and that's because the gh4 you can buy it used right so i said no so then if if you if it's you really stretching your budget then just go with the gh4 it's still an amazing camera gh5 like if, again if you watch my review here link is provided then you'll see that I talk in there and at the end of my conclusion is it's an amazing camera and if it's the first camera you're going to get that's 4k you want all these great functions get it if you can afford it but if you can't or let's say you already own the gh4 and you're thinking of upgrading and it's you know again your budget is tight don't bother because the gh4 is very similar to the gh5 and again it's still an amazing camera so again you know there's differences obviously between the two and that's something i talk about here and in the review so you guys can see that more Thing. but that, that's another camera now if you want to go into the bigger more expensive cameras uh the one you know if you've been watching my youtube channel you always know that's the black magic ursa mini it's the kind of probably the number one that i always go to and and i think and it's the the ursa mini 4 pro it's the one uh, you know that that is the latest one that's been released uh but the 4.6k i also I, I that's the one i use and it's the same they're both the same quality so the quality wise it's there won't be any difference the difference will be uh, the pro has built-in nd filters uh has all these like more buttons right on the camera that you can access settings through there uh which for me it doesn't seem like it's necessary um those buttons and also but in the, because of that you're trading the screen size the, the actually the 4.6 k version has a nicer bigger lcd uh, better more visible and uh, you know, basically when you're working with it so i prefer that the only thing i wish it had is the internal nds that the, the pro version has but any, anyways again you read all this watch my reviews of these cameras and, and all that stuff but that's like you know again one of the pro cameras and i don't get really into any other more expensive pro, pro cameras because again i i don't think it makes for i'm not, I'm not joking like i'll say like 99 percent of us videographers filmmakers it does not make sense to buy a red camera you know or something like that i mean unless you're really having jobs like on a consistent basis of getting you know bringing in revenue of per month you know twenty thirty thousand dollars it's not a camera they really want to buy because even the red cameras i mean if you've l really looked in them just to buy any of the, the recording media extra batteries like all these things it costs h huge amounts of money so really the camera even if you could afford like the twenty thousand dollar whatever or now the, they're saying the fifteen thousand dollar kit um for the for the red raven uh if you can buy that doesn't mean that that's really all the money you're gonna have to spend you're still gonna have to spend thousands of dollars more later on to buy again, extra batteries recording media things like that all these accessories so that's again it's not really something that i think it makes sense for most people to do they're great cameras just like you know the ari amira a beautiful camera doesn't mean that you should buy it i mean all these big budget films that are being shot none of those dps own those cameras i, I can honestly tell you none of them because this it also doesn't even ma make sense because the technology changes so much so they'll rent the latest and you know best that you know and they'll just use the budget for or that project to to pay for it so th that's why i don't even get into advertising and thing and and that's because that's what i think a big thing of investing wisely in gear is is you really want to invest in stuff and i think the earth side is like it gives you these pro tools and that's why i recommend this camera but yet it doesn't um it, it's not going to kill you financially right if it's something that you can still afford it it's okay but like going over ten thousand dollars personally like even for me I, I i don't think it makes sense um so that's 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 my number one advice now there are other cameras obviously under ten thousand dollars that are you know have pro features and all that stuff i don't think they have at least the ones i've used so far still don't compete with the ursa 
and those are cameras like the Sony FS7, very close, but there's some things that has better than the Ursa, but at the end of the day, I, I still say Ursa is like the ultimate kind of, which it shoots raw, it shoots raw and gives you a lot of functions that uh, that the FS7 does, and FS5 is, yeah, has some other cool functions, but the codec is, is kind of hurting, unless you get the raw upgrade, which then it costs more than the Ursa. So you again it might not make sense for you so uh, there's a cameras like that now there's the new ones the panasonic eva and then the canon c200 which i'm excited to try out myself but until i really have like have really used it on some projects and i can give you first-hand experience i'm not going to recommend this stuff so that's something you can trust and when it comes to this gear that i recommend and all my videos and all that stuff but also here on my website Unless I've used it and I have personal experience with it, I'm not gonna really going to be recommending it to you guys. Uh, and, and I might, doesn't mean I might not talk about certain piece of gear, but if I talk about it, I'll let you know, okay, you know, this is my opinion before I actually use it. My, you know, when I, after I use it, I might, my opinion might change. So, so yeah, so that's, that's I guess, the, the kind of thing. And then just quickly jumping back into this, uh, like I said, this is just going through the, the, the page for the, the cameras, but if you go... You know, let's say, you know, once you, let's say, you get your camera, let's say you're a beginner, you buy the, let's say, the A6000 or something like that. Next big thing I would say purchase is probably going to be, and something that you have to get is lenses. Um, so I have different, like, here again, videos, you know, uh, talking about beginner's guide for lenses and things like that. So you can find all these videos and links to these, because some of these are, are older videos, but they still apply. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's easier for you guys to find it. We have it all here on this page. Kind of read through it, you'll get an idea of wh what I kind of mean, but... The number one thing, just kind of as a, as a, an overall, I would say, uh, you know, recap of what's my advice when it comes to gear uh, or bu buying lenses, is you kind of first want to get into uh, buying the kit lenses. And there's a lot of great kit lenses that you can get for, you know, with these cameras. Especially, like, if you're going to go with pro cameras, again, like the C200 or Ursa and stuff, they're not really going to have any kit lenses. But when we're talking about consumer cameras, like the, the really budget ones, like the Sony A6000 or the more, a little bit higher budget, like A6500 from Sony or Panasonic GH5, you can b buy them with a kit lens. And I would advise you guys to, to, to buy those cameras with a kit lens because if you try to buy that lens separately, it's going to be usually, you're going to pay way more money. Whereas if you're buying it as a kit, you just, it's a little bit extra and not a big difference, but but they're great starter lenses. What I mean by that is the, a lot of the, th those lenses are going to be zoom lenses, so they'll give you a nice kind of focal range where let's say you can go from wider to kind of more medium shots uh, and, and stuff like that. I actually bought my Sony A6500, 6500. <laughs> Uh, I bought mine uh, with two kit lenses. There was a kit from B and H they offered. It was like a special at the time, so I got it. And it was the 16 to 50 millimeter, and then it was the 55, I believe, to 200. The Sony lenses, and they're not the fastest lenses. Uh, they're like f 3.5, and they go up to 5.6, something like that. So they're not going to be, you know, ultra low light and that kind of stuff. But they're amazing lenses for like, like I'll tell you, you know, the the kit lens 16 to 50 millimeter from Sony amazing lens it's small light i mean i just love having it on that camera when i fly the cameras on a gimbal that's the lens i use uh because it out of focus performs well on it i can quickly you know reframe the shots zoom in zoom out so like there's a lot of advantages and again these lenses cost you almost nothing when you buy it you know sometimes it might cost you extra 50 bucks when you buy it as a kit so that's the first lens you get into once you have that lens and then then you kind of want to ask yourself which direction you're going are you going more for kind of um I, 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 let, let's say you're a filmmaker who's you know who's maybe doing some wedding videos or things like that to pay your bills but majority you, you what you're going to be shooting is films narrative stuff maybe music videos then i would say you probably want to get a nice set of kind of cinema lenses your know, lenses designed for video shooting so they'll have manual aperture manual focus rings they're usually going to be geared so you can you know pull focus and one you know set of lenses that i always recommend are the um, the rocking on lenses because they're like the really you know they're amazing cinema lenses that are actually affordable so um here where is it here you can have it here like the info about it and you can buy a whole kit of these again just look around on ebay bnh anorama whatever it is there's different links here provided for you guys but you can buy these lenses and they're they're affordable like i said they're actually affordable like you can buy a whole kit from bnh uh you can see here for if, what is it 1900 dollars and you have all the lenses that you pretty much that you need. And we have 24, 35, 50, 85. And I actually, I have this set, but minus the 35. So I have just the three lenses. And that's, 
suits me like for you know i've shot uh, so many film projects and all that stuff with just those three lenses um and it's because they cover the, f the focal range that's the most important and they're very fast t1.5 nice sharp lenses and they have again full manual video you know uh, operation that are designed for video so they're great lenses for that now if you're a filmmaker who maybe wants to somehow you know sometimes experiment and double on kind of narrative music video kind of shooting but a lot of the stuff what you're doing is um is doing uh, if, uh, let's say corporate videos or, or, or live events let's say or documentaries or you know or let's say wedding videos then you probably want to get a good zoom lens but i mean by that is it's going to be similar to a kit lens but the difference is just going to be that you can quickly zoom in zoom out just change your focal length this way instead of having to take off the lenses because with the primes like the rocking on prime set you have to actually physically take off the lenses and it just takes more time so this way you have one lens kind of under maybe two good zoom lenses that kind of cover your whole range and this way you don't have to take as many lenses with you um and and you know and, and you and they're and we're gonna they're gonna be better than the kit lenses in term that they're usually gonna be a bit sharper but also they're gonna be faster meaning they can let in more light um so but those are usually gonna be expensive you can buy actually cinema lens zoom lenses that are very nice but those are crazy expensive so I usually do you know like you just for one lens you might be paying three four thousand dollars so I don't usually advise that but that's why I'm saying uh, buy a good set of zoom lenses for yourself or maybe just one really good zoom lens and then with that you'll be able to shoot a lot of the stuff now the where the disadvantage is and that's why I'm saying if you're a filmmaker shooting narrative stuff where you can stop set up your shots and you have time to change your lenses that's where I'm seeing a good set of prime kind of cinema lenses like the rocking on ones are good is because those are designed for video shooting so they have full manual focus aperture all that stuff whereas the zoom lenses that are not designed really for you know they're affordable they're not really designed for video shooting so they're going to be more for still photography and because of that the the, the aperture usually ring is not going to be there so you're going to have to control the aperture electronically uh you the focus ring is not going to be really good because it's going to be very small as you rotation so to go from infinity to the closest point it's going to be maybe like a question of rotating the ring you know by a few millimeters and that um, just means it's harder to nail fo focus sometimes but there are like i said that's another route to go to because like i said it's the advantages you can quickly change out your focal length and you can shoot in low light with these lenses and there's some lenses here like when it comes to zoom lenses you know and this is something that we probably want to get into later then there's like these canon for example ef 70 to 200 f 2.8 this is like very popular lens for many years um but probably here like when you're just starting out uh getting the uh, well one one lens i would actually also after you get your kit lens is getting the 15 and what is it the nifty 50 i guess they call it uh it's a, just a great all-around lens and then um uh, and you can get them for you know canon sony mount panasonic also has their own version so you can get it because they're the reason why is because they're really cheap lenses uh but they're very fast f 1.8 all of these or 1.7 in case of the lumix the, the lumix lens um, oh, Mac, yeah. can you jump, jump in? We got a bit of a conversation here oh, <laughs> with yeah. the live chat, and because uh, here, uh, person saying that the rocket and lenses they're very soft, and I thought he first he talked about still lenses being soft, but I said you know you're recommending the, the Cine DS lenses, right? Which are very nice lenses from. Like, yeah. I know you like them a lot, but he's saying you know they're soft, and then, and then another thing from your experience, you've been saying that. Zion lenses, they're very expensive. Rockman and Zion lenses yeah. are almost of the same quality as the the much cheaper the DS lens line of Rockman yeah. lenses, right? Uh, I, I would say. Uh, but apparently, this person thinks that all of these lenses, even those two thousand dollar lenses, are very soft. What do you think? Uh, okay, here's the thing. Very soft is again. It's um. Or soft or soft. Okay. Okay. Soft. Okay. okay. So soft. They're, they're, are they going to be soft? Not to somebody who's just watching it and they have no point of reference. If they're, if you're going to have, let's say, a shot that was shot on like the Zeiss Cinema Primes, you know, or Cook lenses, and then you go and you cut from that, you know, given that somebody's not watching it on, on their computer or, or, or phone or something, but like in a cinema big screen, and you cut, you know, from that shot to let's say something that was shot on the, uh, you know, on like the Rockin' on Cine DS. Yeah, you might notice a difference if it's a shot with a lot of details. But again, a lot of times people shoot with you know blown like so soft, uh, out of focus kind of uh, backgrounds and all that stuff. Um, so again, in those cases, you will not see a difference, right? But if you have a shot that's like let's say a wide like an angle landscape shot, you have all these details and everything. Will you notice a difference? Yes, there will be a difference, but it's not. 
such a big difference that people are really going to be like, oh my god, I can't watch this anymore because it's you know, it's softer. Yes, it's not going to be as sharp. But guess what? Also, depends on what um, you know uh, aperture because. Uh, like the, w when you watch my, for example, my, my video where I compare the Zine lenses, which are a lot more expensive kind of cinema lenses, and they're very comparable to some of these expensive, like the Canon, for example, you know, cinema line lenses that they have. Uh, and when you compare the Zines to the Rokinon, you know, the affordable Rokinon, you know, the, the DS, uh, in the set, if you know, filmmaker lenses that I call them, uh, when you compare it to that, when they're full open aperture, yes, you're gonna see a bigger difference there when it comes to the sharpness, especially on the edges. But once you, you know, you like I said, you almost never. I mean, sometimes you will be shooting wide open, but that's in those cases where it's low light. You're probably going for really, you know, shallow depth of field. So in those cases, again, the sharpness is not gonna matter that much. I mean, you can only really see that difference when you're shooting test charts. But when you're just shooting actual footage, you're not gonna be noticing those differences uh, because, like I said, when you're getting something that has a lot of detail, like let's say a landscape shot of like forest or city, and you have all these sharp edges and details, then usually you're gonna be closing down the lens anyways. And trust me, the Cine DS, when they're like at an f4. You know, somewhere around there at 5.6. I mean, they're they were very very sharp lenses. So, again, it just really comes down to how you're shooting and all that stuff. And the question is, you know, if those very rare cases when you're shooting wide open and where you might actually see that it's slightly softer, are you willing to pay as a filmmaker, as somebody who's you know making a living out of this, uh, not a rental house that just owns all these expensive lenses and rents them, but somebody who's actually you know needs to pay for this stuff? Is it worthwhile? And again, is it wise for you to invest in a lens that, let's say, might cost five thousand dollars just for one lens because it's a tiny bit sharper when it's wide open, comparing it to a you know three hundred, four hundred dollar lens? I would lens, say, you know. I would answer like my answer would be: Will the client like care about it? Will the client pay for that equipment to have that extra thing? And I think most clients would say, no, I don't care, right? Yeah, you will, they won't notice. Yeah, the difference. Now, the, you know, yeah. if you're getting into like. Uh, if cinema anamorphic lenses and things like that, I mean that's a whole completely other conversation. But yeah, just when it comes to regular spherical lenses, uh, that's again there is a difference there. I'm not saying there isn't, but there's a, there's actually an amazing video done by uh, what is it, the Rocket Jump Film School, uh, the, where they compare one of those like five thousand dollar lenses to like the Nifty Fifty. And trust oh, yeah. me, when you I've see the it, yeah. test charts, it's funny video too, all that stuff. When you see the test charts, yes, there's a difference, but who cares? Like, really, who gives a shit when the, the test charts? Like, I'll, I'll shoot some test charts when you watch my videos just to kind of show you, but usually you'll see me say, ah, eh, whatever, just, just disregard it. Because it's, like I said, at the end of the day, who cares? It's a test chart. And you're not, that's not what people are watching when they're watching a movie in a cinema or whatever. So it's, it's how does it really look when you're looking at an actual scene? Is there a big difference? And they're really, like I said, it's, there's, just because it might get tiny bit of thing, like let's say you know, overall the lenses are like you know really good quality, but the the cinema lenses that cost you know ten times as much might be this much better. But they, like I said, it's this much better, but costing way way more. It doesn't make sense to spend that money. And again, that's why I'm saying it's investing wisely in film gear. Don't get stuck on this thing where, oh, I can't do a film or my projects look like you know like crap because I didn't have this five thousand or ten thousand dollar lens. No, that's totally wrong. You know, thinking. With a kit lens, you should be able to make your projects look really beautiful and interesting. Uh, you know, and then it's just later on, let's say we have a bigger budget and you can rent better gear, it's going to look that much better, but the difference will be minimal. It's not going to be a huge difference when you get that pro gear. Same thing with the cameras and all that stuff. So so that's why that's where I would say it's investing wisely in gear is, um, uh, yeah, is, 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 a, is a, you know, it's a very important thing, right? But anyways, uh, if I, again, we can go through this more. If you guys have more questions right now, I yeah, can answer them. Uh, I was, we have more questions. I, I was sorry. thinking of, of yeah. showing... Uh, sorry, because I'm cutting off. But yeah, I was yeah. thinking of showing because we have a lot of great submissions. Uh, but I'm kind of going to leave it because this topic took longer to talk than, than I thought. So we'll leave it for next week. So those of you guys who submitted already a week ago or two weeks ago, I, trust me, you guys are there on the queue list. There's a beautiful, beautiful work. And I'm going to show your work, but maybe next week we can dedicate a whole episode to that. Um, but anyways, let's answer some questions. Okay, so um, here... Uh so what's the, from Tasco says uh, he's asking what's the cheapest camera that doesn't have shutter roll because he says that all the cameras you recommend uh, have horrible shutter roll. No, I mean the 
uh, if GH5 is pretty damn good. If you guys watch my test, uh, the camera shoot, the 4K camera shootout where I tested GH5 with the A6500 and the Ursa uh, Pro or, or Mini, uh, the when you compare them, you'll actually see that the the A6500, yes, in 4K, pretty horrendous rolling shutter. But uh, again, it's not always going to be visible, so again, depends on what you're shooting. But when you're looking at the Ursa, I mean, it's it's I would even say better than like the Red Epic, which is you know again, or or you know the or the I'd say the camera that really has a beat is the or the the the, the, the yeah the Ari Amira, um, because uh, yeah again, it's just there's very few cameras in there that have a beat, but yet these are cameras that are being used for for big budget you know uh, projects, feature films, all that stuff. So it's uh, it's there, but it's so minimal that it's like again, it doesn't really. It's not really going to be something that you're going to have to be worrying about. Um, so so the Ursa is actually pretty amazing. So that's the reason why I'm recommending that camera too. And the GH5 is pretty good. It's very close to Ursa, not as good, but very close. Again, watch my 4K camera shootout of 2017, and you, you'll be able to see it there. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's some cameras that have those issues. Again, doesn't mean you can't shoot with with those cameras. You just have to be aware of it and shoot around it, right? So yeah. And another question? Yeah. Um, what's the best uh, budget lighting? I, I answered to the person that uh, hardware lights are the be best budget, I guess, option. But do you want to add to that? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's again, you can look at uh, our page uh, where we, we have the, the gear kind of that we're recommending. Probably if you're just starting out, and there's a really good, there's a link to there that I provided to a video that is, uh, I think, in a perfect video that illustrates the. Uh, basically what you can do with hardware lights and I literally uh, you know uh, maybe actually let me quickly just bring it up so while I'm talking you can kind of you guys can see it uh, but basically it's um, shooting I'm shooting a scene with both the hardware lights that I did or kind of do it yourself you could say um, let me just here find this video uh, it's on the page on the lights page oh yeah if you go to the lights re recommended lights then you yeah. oh, okay uh, I found right. it yeah so uh, here, let me just show it to you guys. You guys can kind of see it. And oh man, this is. I always keep on getting these ads with Carly Klaus. Whatever, it's like it's getting annoying, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's oh, like God, every I'm video I watch, it's that's all they show. Like uh, Carly. I'm Klaus getting two. I'm oh, getting two. <laughs> and host host Gator too. Oh. Her and host Gator. And it's like Wix so already. Like it's you know it's nothing against Wix, but it's just like when they when you overdo it with ads, I think it just gets annoying. Anyways, so here's a video where I show kind of how I'm getting this kind of film noir lighting, um, and I actually end up using these very cheap uh, lights. Let me kind of go go forward so you guys can see. See, look, hardware lights, and I'm showing you how to use clamps, and and I show you the result that you can kind of get basically with this, and here's a. Uh, Almost finished. So here with the color grading, kind of show how it looks. Uh, so let me just jump. It's a it's a cool video, I think, on its own. So this is the kind of the finished product. You can see with the hardware lights. But then I go. Oh, now I'm gonna get the same shot using kind of more pro lights. And so and then you see a difference. And to be you see comparing like this kind of a pro light to kind of a hardware light. What's the differences? And again, it's uh, you're just spending a lot more money, and there's really not a a difference. I would even say uh, maybe I like the other version of the of this scene that I shot uh, better with the hardware light. So, at the end of the day, light is light. It's just you got to think of it as as a uh, you know little light is nothing more than little you know pockets of energy called you know what is it uh, photons, right? So you if you think of it along those terms, that's kind of what I always was teaching when I was doing like when I'm doing any kind of talks or filmmaking workshops. If you think of it in those terms, you realize that anything that emits light, and literally in this world, almost everything is a light source. There's differences if it's direct light source or reflected light source, but everything emits light. Like even my face right now is emitting light. That's why you guys can see me because the light that's coming out off of this light and this light here, boom, bounces off. So it's actually emitting a light here and going to the camera. So you can use uh, boards to reflect things, different color boards to create different effects. Uh, so literally, you could be a piece of cardboard. Um, you can use, you know, tin foil as a reflector, and, and there's some tutorials I have on on how to use natural, basically light, and how to use just everyday objects and kind of light your scenes with it. And where you can really see the big difference, uh, you know, like of, of basically of, of what your kind of w w how just a little bit of innovation and a little bit of like using some again household objects can make a big difference in your in your shot. So like I said, at the end of the day, whether it's hardware lights, all that stuff. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you can't get a beautiful-looking shot. The difference really is you're spending a lot more money for pro gear 
so that you can, in a way, look more professional. So if you're going to show up on a set and you have, you know, clients that are paying you, let's say they're paying you, I don't know, $10,000 to shoot a video and you show up there with like, you know, a candle to shoot with and then they're like, okay, that's the best you could afford with the $10,000 we gave you. Uh, the that, other, that might make the other, you look bad, right? <laughs> the other thing is though, is the speed with which you can work. And that's you know, another thing. Lights. And also safety, like there's also safety, Some you know, we don't have there all the equipment, sometimes it's yeah. just... Exactly. It's more of a chance of, of an accident, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. But you've got to pay money for that, right? For those, uh, those, those, you know, again, advances. The fact that you can work but, faster, look more pro. But to just practice and learn cinematography, you can already do a lot with oh, yeah, yeah. hardware rights, right? And again, but, uh, there's a bunch of videos we have on our YouTube channel. You guys can can see and where where I should the same thing with with hardware stuff or like like professional filmmaking tools, both inside and outside, like using the sun and then using the uh using just do it yourself stuff so uh what's the yeah, next the, question the, i mean just i wanted to add to the oh. light here recommendations it's not a cheap light but i think uh, here uh, you talk on your page you talk a lot about the aperture lights right and uh, the specifically there's the cop the 120t or one or 120 d lights yeah and, and you have the you have one of those two lights and you've got a softbox and basically it's not a cheap light it's 645 dollars but plus the softbox but I mean, light like that, you, can, you have a light like that. It's just going to cover you in a lot of situations. So you can also look at it like this way if you want, you know, something on light on a budget. So maybe then you're getting several lights. Just get one good light that will yeah. be useful in a lot of situations, right? Yeah. I mean, I would almost say because there's there's some videos that I've done where like you can get these really really cheap those big like LED bulbs that have kind of a weird green cast to it and stuff, and you can use those. And those are like if you can find super deals on those. Like, you know, like there's a kit, um, uh, I did a video about it, where it's like 50 bucks and you get like three of these lights. So again, it's very cheap and if you're just starting out, yeah, you, you can get those and they look pretty professional and, they, and they'll and they allow you to do some, a lot, lot more stuff than you can do with hardware lights. But it, I would say the kind of range where you want to be careful is buying these lights that are like $200, $300, but they're not all there or maybe even, you know, $400. But it's like I said, when you're spending that kind of money, I would say, yeah, maybe it's bit better to go just save a little bit more. And then again, don't buy it on credit cards, but just save a little bit more and then buy, uh, you know, that, let's say that aperture light, let's say that's $600, but buy something that's really good. It's going to last you long also, like lights, professional lights, you should look, watch out for things that are also not just the quality of light, but even just how they're built and how they're going to last last you. Because again, there's cheap little, like the $50 lighting kit that I that, that did a video about it's it's you know good for fifty dollars but those things oh my god those bulbs are fragile as hell like you you sometimes just hit it with your finger it could break on you so you gotta be super careful with those bulbs uh and just the stands are a little more flimsy and stuff so that's where you're putting also your money as in uh you you buy a fifty dollar lighting kit it's probably not gonna last you very long on a real production where things might you know like i remember we were shooting with one of these lights once and I think it was, I forgot, somebody on our set, like, basically tipped, you know, pulled the cable, remember that little kiss? And the light went down, light bulb burst into pieces, oh, and yeah. then we, we, were, we were kind of really stuck. We were looking for a replacement, and it was, yeah, it was made, made it more difficult. Whereas when you have, a, like, a light, like, the, the ones from Aperture, or there's another one from KMTV I used, this big edge light. And actually, in the review, I talk about it, I show, and... It was raining, the light didn't, you know, nothing happened to it, and on top of that, we were outside, the light got, you know, wind blew on it, and we forgot to secure it properly, and the light went down, hit the, the concrete, and it was pretty damn high, and, you know, goes up, so I was pretty much sure, like, oh man, we just lost the light, but no, took it, the cable just, just got disconnected, plugged it back in, and kept on working, so it works to this day, so... Again, that's where a good light, where the where you should be spending money on, and and again, if you watch my reviews, that's where I'm, I can honestly tell you guys from experience, this light, that this happened to it, and it works, right? So, uh, any okay, other questions? Uh, sure, this whole bunch. Uh, we'll see how many we can get to, but okay. we'll try to get more, to all of them, all of them. Next one is from Kim uh, Weber, and she's uh, she uses GH4, and she needs uh, image stabilization, and she's got Olympus lenses. So now she's got a thousand dollars to spend on either Olympus Olympus body uh -huh. or Panasonic IS you know stabilized lenses which one do you recommend oh uh, <laughs> difficult question Can I, okay, right right away I'll jump in and say yeah. don't get the Panasonic IS lenses because for video just to have the uh, IS in the lenses is not enough I mean if you're going to you go, so you're going to be using the you know the good lenses the IS lenses but you're still using the GH4 
by itself, I don't think you you still need a gimbal. You still need a way to stabilize it. Yeah, that's now, true. Now with the with the GH5, yeah, GH5, it's got you know the end body, and it's, it's going to use the dual IS. In that situation, yeah, the it's pretty good. I mean, it's really for like pro work, you probably still want to opt for you know having actually you know standalone stabilizer, but you can you can you know it's pretty it's. It's the best actually out there, I think. You know, in terms of like in body stabilization. Yeah, I mean, Canon is also very, very good, but uh, this one is yeah, it's it's really good as long as you've got the in body, in camera, and in the lens, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I don't think that's a good solution now with the Olympus. And I, I'm I don't have experience with the Olympus, but I'm again like unless the Olympus body has in body stabilization, I don't think it does. But if, unless you have basically dual, and it's all you know, uh, basically the system, basically you know. Uh, Matches or makes you know uh, uses takes advantage of both in body and in, in the lens. As, 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 unless you have a system like that, you really the IS will not be good enough really to so that you would not have to use um, you know uh, any stabilizer. Because I mean the the lenses that are stabilized they're good for they help you with photography. You know like that that why make a, they make enough of a difference in many cases that yeah they will cover you. But for video you want to have a you know nice tracking shot. It's not going to be good enough. Yeah, what do you think? Well, I, I, th I think you answered. I mean, for me, I, 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 I don't want to add more because I don't have as much experience with uh, um, the you know Olympus lenses. So that's why, like, from my own personal but experience. But I think what you're talking about the image stabilization and stuff. I mean, yeah, it, it but makes sense. Just, just the lens stabilization though, it's not good enough. I mean, on the Panasonic yeah. for sure, right? I mean, yeah. we have we have stabilized le uh, Panasonic lenses on the GH4, and you never just relied, you know, on the on that stabilization, right? You would always use, if you want the stabilized shot, you needed to use a, a stabilizer gimbal or something like that for your GH4, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, let me ask a quick question here on Facebook. I see uh, uh, from uh, Raymond Berker, Berkers, uh, sorry if I mispronounced it. Anyways, it's uh, I'm using a Canon 5D uh, Mark III shooting um, photos lately, but more and more switching to video. I'm thinking of switching to Sony. Would you advise to go for the A7R2 or wait for a model like the A7, uh, basically, uh, I guess, 3 or A7S3 maybe? Um, I mean, to me, yeah, it's, you know, it really d depends on whether you really care about the, the extra pixels. I mean, because, you, you know, if you're doing large prints and stuff, that's what you're doing more photography for and that pays your bills, then go with the A7R2. I mean, it shoots great video still, and I did a review of the ca that camera. Uh, but it's just you know, maybe not all the way there in certain you know terms like for example the A7S2 has certain advantages and uh, especially the low light right so it, that's where the thing but are you getting you know in the A7S2 for example or we'll see what the, the three version will be like but A7S2 you're getting you know much lower resolution when it comes to actual capturing the stills but it's still with the 12 megapixels it's still good enough for like 8 by 10s and a lot of stuff so unless you're doing big format prints yeah, I would still say go with the A7S, um, whereas A7R2 is, like I said, the major advantage there is just you can get that extra resolution, right? the, the crazy, crazy amount of res. So, so that's that's that would be my advice to you, uh, Raymond. So, anyways, Lucas. Yeah. Uh, okay. The next one. Um, so from Jeff, he and uh, he invested in the Zuan Crane version okay. two, which we just reviewed, right? Yeah. And uh, he's using it with the GH4. And would you think it's a solid piece of gear worth having around? Yeah, I mean, so if, if, if you watch my review, uh, you'll see that I, I reviewed basically. I'm gonna do individual reviews of each of these gimbals, but I reviewed the uh, Zeon right, Crane version two, um, the uh, Feiyutek A2000, and the Moswa Air. So those three gimbals, and I kind of literally just show you what each one of them offer and you know where they differ. Uh, they're all, in terms of just stability, they're all identical. I honestly did not see a difference. So sometimes people wonder, or, or again, see these discussions of like, the crane is way, you know, smoother than this. It's not. It's honestly, when you actually, and that was, that was the reason why I did that video like that, is I went the same setting, the same, you know, location, the same actress I had, everything it was identical, and I just did it the same scene over and over on the different gimbals. And then also did it with like the other scenes with, like, for example, 
have the heavier camera load, how they see how they perform and running, how they perform, like all these things. And to be honest, they all are identical. Right? There was no difference. Uh, they operate slightly differently, like some cameras, you know, like the Mozua doesn't respond uh, right away, like in the follow mode when you're see turning left and right, whereas the crane was a lot more responsive. You might like that, some people might not like it. Uh, but at the same time, all of them have uh, phone apps that you can go in, change the sensitivities, all, all that stuff. So really, I mean, again, all these gimbals, so the crane, you know, like I said, is just as good as all the other gimbals. Don't think you bought something, that's the thing. It really just comes down to, I guess, what you can get for the price. If you can find a deal, like at the time when I was doing that video, the best deal was for the most while. It was the cheapest, and you got the most things included, you know, when you bought the kit. The crane had offered the least because you're paying, you know, basically the, the much more money than the Mozwa, but you are not getting like the the stand for it, like a tripod or, or you know, see the dual handles or things like that. They don't provide any of the camera cables. But again, if you can get that cheaper and that at that then at that moment might turn out to be a better deal. So it really just depends on what you find. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a great combo, especially if you're going to be shooting with these small cameras, like you said, GH4. You look as you said, yeah. Yeah, so if you're shooting with a GH4, yeah, that's 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 exactly what you, what you want. Okay, um, here we've got a question from Idan Sihor or Shihor. Um, he's about to buy a whole filmmaking kit that will include camera, microphone, recorder, mm -hmm. ND filter, Steadicam, and memory cards. And he's asking, is that the way to go? I guess or the, yeah, that's what he's he's asking. Is that the good way to go? This is sorry. Can you but, say that kit again? again? Yeah, it's camera, microphone, audio recorder, ND filter, Steadicam, and memory cards, you know. Okay, oh, but he doesn't know yet which ones. He doesn't, it's just like, I guess, is that the other piece of equipment, I guess, that you would recommend including this? Uh, I mean, well, I guess it seems like you're going to be shooting stuff, like, on the go, maybe like wedding videos or, like, outside somewhere uh, where you're going to be moving a lot. So then in that case, yeah, you don't need a tripod. Uh, you might want to look into a monopod, like, sometimes... If you want to just get those static shots, um, you know, if on a on a on a monopod basically or on a tripod, you can get those perfect kind of static shots. Otherwise, with the gimbal or you know a handheld stabilizer, you're you, it's going to be a lot more difficult to get a nice static shot when you're especially on a longer lens. Uh, so that that's something to consider. So if you can, you know, stretch your budget a little bit, I said get something where because at least for me, it's like just having a decent tripod where I can put it or a monopod. And get those nice static shots it comes in handy right I, I i shoot a lot of stuff like that but if you don't think you'll be using it like let's say if you're doing uh, I don't know, constant coverage and you're going to be moving around between people and stuff then yeah then there's no point in you probably setting up ever a monopod or a tripod uh, but that, that's one thing also another thing is again i'm assuming you're not going to be doing this kind of stuff you're going to be shooting outside natural light or or let's say whatever location like available practical light is there but if you want to do something where you have full control over the lighting, you want to also maybe first before you, I would say, spend money on things like a stabilizer, maybe you spend some money on your lighting gear because lighting's going to make a big difference. But again, that's only if you can set up lighting. If you're doing stuff, again, live event coverage, you know, concerts, wedding videos, there you just have to use available light. And yeah, then don't worry about it. And then I think it's a pretty solid kit for that kind of shooting. So it really just depends what you're shooting. Uh, any other okay. questions? Yeah. Um, okay, it's a similar question. So somebody has a GH5, or it's Harvey Mullins. Uh, so Harvey has a GH5 and uh, the f2.8 12 to 35 Panasonic lens, and so he, you know, he was going to buy his next piece of gear, and he's looking for recommendations. So he's looking either at a prime lens, f1.4 lens, or a, I'm assuming it's a prime, yeah, and uh, or a Roach. Uh, Shotgun microphone or, or an external recorder or a gimbal. Uh, does he specify like w w the camera? Uh, doesn't, the, the, doesn't specify the, like what he's going to be using it for. Or uh, but, but with the camera, like he's saying... Um, it's uh, H5. Yeah, but does he specify if he's gotten it with a kit lens or no? It's the, yeah, 12 to 35. 12 you know? to 30. Oh, okay, okay. It's not a kit lens, but it's the most popular. Yeah, that, that one. Uh, lens, yeah. yeah, I would say if you have that lens, then I, I think that's an amazing lens for the GH5 or GH4. So that's the one first one that I got for my my GH4. You're pretty you're set for like I would say again it's, it goes all the way you know to uh, to 35 on the micro four thirds. That's like equivalent of like a 50 mil lens uh, on the you know APS-C or, or yeah more or less there. So you're you're you really you have a nice portrait lens. You have a nice wide angle lens. I would say. 
you can shoot like 90% of the stuff you know that I shoot is within that those focal focal lengths. So you're good for that. So probably after that is yeah, ask yourself what's more important. Are you going to be uh, need to capture the audio live on there? You know because like let's say if you're doing narrative stuff or film, then you're not going to worry about it because you're going to have an audio guy or you know uh, it's going to be music video, so you're going to be not going to be capturing audio at all. But if you're shooting live events or things like that, then yeah, you probably want to have a good microphone. Um, so the Rode one is thing. There's actually, if you can hold off, I, I just got in the mail. I'm very excited. It's the Asden mics, and I know I kind of been trashing on some of the mics that I've been reviewing from them, uh, like the wireless system. But now the company reached out to me, and they were like, "Tom, we love your videos, but we think you, we we can change your mind about our product." So they're like. We have these new products, and it's funny because when I was at NAV, I saw their new microphones, which I have no idea whether they sound good, but the functionality that they offer, and they have like a mic that's cheaper than the Rode mic, but it has better, I think, functionality, uh, at least like when I saw it on, on the, you know, at NAB, and plus, you know, just on paper seeing the spec. So now I'm going to be doing a test on it, hopefully having the video like maybe within a week. So you can, maybe that can also kind of sway your opinion. Maybe instead of going with the Rode Video Mic Pro, you might go with that one. But but yeah, I would say that's probably the next good investment is get a get a good mic, um, eh, or again something you know to stabilize your shots. I mean, with with that lens, you're you're like I said, you're probably covered for a lot of uh, majority of, of shooting that you're going to be doing, right? So yeah, so I, I think it's it's a s smart decision, okay. wise way yeah. of investing. <laughs> Here's a question from Hamza Yusuf, and he's starting a production company, and he's uh, deciding between the Alexa Mini or the Red Hel Helium camera, and he's confused about the Alexa Mini and also wondering whether the Ari is going to whether they're about to release the Alexa Mini 2 like sometime this year. So, do you know, have any scoop on the Alexa no, Mini? No, I mean I'll tell you guys that. I don't even like to try not to stay up to date with like the, the like I said the really high end cameras and the reason is because again for me as a filmmaker when especially le like lately I've been just kind of shooting a lot of stuff with these kind of mid sized productions where they don't really like I said they, you know I shot a film in India last last feature film which was on the on the Ursa uh, Mini uh, and it was again it was sufficient enough so like I I don't have especially when it comes to the latest stuff as much like up to date info about the the latest high-end cinema cameras but i would almost say it almost doesn't matter because yes there's going to be differences there but they're very again it's m incremental like that's very small changes so it's is there a big difference between and what and is the new you know uh, I, I, I i think um, ari you know or alexa mini uh, coming out uh, soon i mean to be honest i don't know to be honest i don't care <laughs> i just don't don't stay like connected to that stuff because if you know that yeah, they're probably going to release it but it, again it's not gonna those prices you'll see that they those cameras hold their value because they're kind of overpriced in general but they're hold their value because yeah there's not as big turnaround of these cameras people don't change them around like once they buy it they stick to it so because of that you're not going to see a big difference there in terms of savings either just because you bought this one and then things so you can always like if you need a camera right now and you can you know let's say buy the the, the, the mini just buy that, uh, the, you know, and then and then afterwards the Alexa Mini, you can, if the new one comes out, you can still sell it for a good, you know, you're not, not going to be a big difference there in the price drop. You can still sell it and then get the new upgrade. And the same thing with the with the red, the helium. So, uh, and again, it just, you know, if you're honestly asking me, I mean, if you have that much money that you can drop on a camera that much, I, I, I would still say it's probably better to just rent that camera. Like, my honest thing get the red raven something you know still your let's see if you love the the red line uh, red lineup of cameras and i do they make great cameras but you know or the same thing with ari they make beautiful cameras but let's say it's more affordable something you can still use but then every so on when you you know and you can get familiar with their system and all that workflow but then when you need to sometimes get the high end the helium whatever it's I know, to, honestly I don't think it's a it's a smart decision dropping that kind of money on that camera, especially when the helium is going to get replaced with something else you know quickly and then, and then something else, and you probably will won't always want to be like if you're going for the top you probably always want to be on the top so it's going to make more sense for you let's say five months down the line to just rent the latest new thing that came out instead of being like well I have this and you know it's but I would want to get the latest one but I already own this one so it doesn't make sense for me to rent it and stuff so that's why I would say it's 
it's if you have that kind of money it's spend that money better on the actual production hire good people to work with you uh, you know put you know the production value in front of the camera that's where you're really gonna see a difference uh, that would be my advice and that's also the reason why again I don't really keep up to date and whenever I do shoot projects where you know the quiet leader the, the, the client requires it or the job requires the latest camera you know um, you know like the latest top of the line cinema cameras it's it's very easy to kind of jump into it I'll just look at the latest specs okay what's the best out there rent the camera usually for an extra one or two days beforehand so I can kind of see okay have there been any big updates since the last version of the camera that I used and then yeah you just jump on it and you use it uh, but I don't and again it's my own opinion I don't think it's smart buying a camera in that price range so so I would say just don't buy that camera <laughs> either of these okay uh, what's that on? what's your preferred gimbal for the Ursa Mini uh, preferred gimbal for the Ursa Mini. That's a good question because I don't know if, it's, if there is a preferred gimbal. I, I actually I shot a video. It's being edited uh, right now, and it's and it's, it might be out even this coming week. Uh, and it's basically actually about I had you know, some friends, filmmaker friends from uh, from Washington, join me the Gear Jones guys, the guys who did like really cool camera tests. Uh, cinema camera tests and they came down we were kind of trying out different configurations of this basically they're putting the ursa mini on uh whether it's the 4k 4.6k or the pro putting it on a gimbal and what's the thing and something doing it still with a budget um my experience the best option right now from what i've tried uh, and i haven't tried it on a job but i tried it at nab is the latest uh, dji ronin 2. it's a crazy expensive setup it's like was it seven thousand dollars or something so it's just expensive so it's again probably you know most people are just gonna rent that gimbal or you know or if, again if you have that kind of money you, you're probably not even gonna be looking back at other options uh, the Movi I found doesn't have anything that I like that's so as, as easy and plug and play with that camera and that's because the Ursa is kind of longer shaped but yet all the weight is in the front still so it's kind of awkward camera in that sense to, especially to balancing on a gimbal and if you get the DJI Ronin the, the, the original one you're gonna have to get extension arms because otherwise you will not be able to balance it un unless you put like a tiny little pancake lens on it so then you're very limited with your lens options so for me the best budget option right now that i found was the um, uh, a little spoiler alert if you want to watch the video for more info you'll find it but basically it was the the came tv prodigy but it wasn't perfect so i'll tell you that and for various reasons it wasn't even the gimbal itself but again watch the video when i release it so you can kind of see but at the end, I kind of was like, the easiest way is to literally put it on a kind of a traditional old Steadicam, Glidecam, and and the one that I think is the best, and I did a video already about it with the Ursa Mini, is the, the Devon Graham uh, Glidecam. I found that that one has the nicest quick release plates, takes the weight of the Ursa with like a nice cinema lens on there, no problem. Uh, you can even put other accessories like wireless video system or something. So it's a great gimbal. And it's again that you have to learn to use it because it's not a three-axis digital, you know, stabilizer. But it's um, it's it's a great, 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 you know, glide cam, and it just works, and it's affordable, and and it just for me at the end of the day, like when I was we were doing these tests with the Ursa and then this the Cam TV Prodigy, it's just there's so many things that's such a headache. With it. and you when you watch the video, you'll see it just takes so long to set up and all these things to try to troubleshoot. And then I was like, screw it, just put it on the on a you know on the glide cam and just fly it like that. It's so much faster. So again, it sometimes it's the time and all that stuff you know uh, that really matters more. So especially when you're on a, on a really tight kind of a production schedule, shooting a film or something like an indie film. So. Okay. Um, what do you think about the Meta Bones uh, for the GH5? It, the Meta Bones is great. I still use it. There's the different versions. It depends how how much you want. And actually, I did a video about it with, the, with comparing it with the GH4, like using the Meta Bones. But I'm working on a video uh, probably in two weeks. Uh, I've, I've gotten a whole bunch of adapters, both basically like the speed boosters or uh, you know focal uh, uh, reducers um, that that are going to be f for micro four thirds. So like the GH5, GH4 but also for like APS-C size cameras like the um, uh, Sony A6500, 6300, uh, those types of cameras. So I'm going to be kind of putting different filters and different brands, different costs, because the, the only thing with the Meta Bones is it's expensive. So there's some other options out there that are a lot cheaper, like, you know, one-fourth of the price. But, uh, again, are they just as good? Well, if I'm cur kind of curious myself. So I'm going to be doing these tests again, same setting, same everything, side by side, and you guys will be able to see 
which is the best option. If so far I haven't gotten any bad things really with the meta bones, like any bad artifacts, all that stuff, it's just it's the most expensive of those types of adapters. So, uh, and they're pretty good when it comes to, or as good as you can get with adapting like lenses, so you can still use the AF in, in them or image stabilization. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you can hold off on buying one of these adapters, just wait and I'm gonna do a, a video where side by side comparing the different options, different brands, and seeing maybe it doesn't make sense to spend six hundred dollars on a Metabones adapter when you can get the same thing for 150 bucks. So, all right, let's it. let's wrap up. We got more. Yep, I was gonna say the same fun. thing. It's 120 when went overboard, but yeah, it's, it's fun. There's I see there's a lot of questions, so leave me uh, more questions. I guess in the like once the video publishes here on on YouTube, same thing on Facebook. Just leave the questions there, uh, and then I'll try to get get to them uh, maybe later on today or tomorrow. Uh, and then yeah, and then that's how I think it's best way to proceed with all this stuff. So, um, f and then also join us as always next week. You can always follow up and you know ask the questions. That, th those of you who the, you know th that I haven't gotten to your questions next week, but also next week I think we're gonna do it, it more just showcasing people's work without you know spending time on any specific topic. But it was fun, great turnout. I see a lot of people watching, a lot of questions. So it's good to see that you guys are enjoying the show. So anyways, thank you and bye. Thank you. Bye.